So, okay. Welcome everyone. This is the Collingwood Public Library and this is a collaboration with um, Simcoe Libraries. There's nine of us working together, bringing us authors. Um, and we've been doing this virtually, um, doing this Zoom sessions starting in the spring and we'll go right to the end of the year. We've been having some fabulous authors join us, which has um, been a real treat. So tonight we have Ken Haig and I'll tell you a bit about Ken. Ken has trouble remaining in one place. He blames his nomadic childhood for this. His father was constantly changing careers, uprooting, relocating his family to different communities across Canada. In his 20s, Ken had a yen to see the world, so he became a teacher, first in the tiny Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, the subject of his first book, Under the Holy Lake. Then China, where he met his wife, and later the Canadian Arctic. Once married with children, Ken settled down and became a librarian, most recently at the Collingwood Public Library. He currently lives in Clarksburg and South Georgian Bay Area where he's been writing his book and waiting for the pandemic to end like us all so he can do some further traveling. I'd also like to mention that Ken is now a finalist for the Hillary Weston Writers Award. So that's quite an honor and we're very proud of Ken. So now I'd like to turn it over to our guest of honor and Ken's going to, um, behind the scenes, we're gonna have him share his screen and he'll take it away. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you for that nice introduction. I briefly lost my camera, but it's back. So I was panicking for a second. Um, when in doubt, just unplug it and plug it back in again, I guess is the best the best thing. So um, yeah, so I, I Last was it last Wednesday, I was sitting down to breakfast and I opened my uh, iPad to check my email. And the first thing that popped up was um, a news release from the Writers Trust of Canada that said Hillary Weston finalists. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's see uh, who's on the short list this year. And I opened it up and I started scrolling down. And to my surprise, I saw the cover of my own book. So that was a, a bit of a shock. And it's still it's still feeling a bit um unreal to be honest um but it's uh, it's a great honor to be on that list and there's there's some terrific other books on the list as well including three uh books by indigenous authors all of which deal um with the the long-lasting trauma of the residential schools in in one way or the other so i would encourage you to look at the whole list for the finalists and and pick up one of those books and and read it because um we really do need to to learn a bit more about this but tonight I'm going to be talking about the subject of my book, uh, which was a journey I took across southern England. And I'll, maybe I'll start by sharing my screen and then I can show you some pictures. There we go. Now, uh, Gordon, can you see that? Is that looking okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay, great. All right, I'll get started then. So, so my book is called On Foot to Canterbury. Um, it was published just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's already it's already out of print, I'm afraid. So if you've tried to buy one, you've probably been disappointed. But I, I understand that it's going back for a second printing, and they should have it in bookstores in about a week. So sorry about that. Nobody really saw the, the prize coming or the, or the effect that that was going to have. But um, I do encourage you to, to, you know, go to your library, get a copy, use your local bookstore. I know here in, uh, in town, uh, Jessica's Book Nook in Thornbury has copies. I think they still have copies left. So if you're interested in picking one up, um, please support your independent booksellers. Okay, this is not working, so I'm not able to. Okay, what I'm going to do is this is, is going to be. There we go. Okay. So this is the route. As you can see, I, I walked from Winchester to Canterbury. Um, the path is called the Pilgrim's Way. It's, it's a very old road in England. Some, some writers believe it's the oldest road in England, that it just sort of started in the Neolithic times and continued to be used right through the medieval times and right into the 18th uh, century when it sort of fell out of, out of use. And um, traditionally, the, the path that it took, people called the Pilgrim's Road, but it really wasn't until the 20th century that it sort of got rediscovered as a walking path. But it is considered the, the traditional path that pilgrims took to Canterbury, to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket, um, if you were traveling from the west of England. Uh, obviously, if you were coming from London, you would have taken a, a different 
route or if you were coming from France, you probably sailed to Dover and walked inland from there. But if you were walking from the west, this was the route that you took. The, the Pilgrim's Way follows a chalk escarpment called the North Downs. Um, so the, the chalk escarpment starts at Dover. It's that, that chalk you see in Dover carries along right across southern England and goes right up to the Salisbury Plains. So it was sort of a natural corridor for people walking from east to west. And people have sort of said, what does it look like? Those of you who live close to me in, in, in the South Georgian Bay area, probably the nearest analogy would be the Niagara Escarpment. So for, for English people, it's very similar to the Niagara Escarpment. It goes through some of the most densely par populated parts of the country, but because it's this chalk escarpment that uh, towns weren't built on and there wasn't a lot of farms, it just is a sort of nice green corridor right across Southern England. It's, it's very rural, even though a mile on either side, you have um, ra relatively built up areas. So, and it was a 14 day trip. People have asked that as well. So the reason for taking the trip is a bit complicated. Um, the idea originated when my father decided he was going to retire. So I suggested it as something we could do together. So that's a picture of my dad and I when I graduated my BA. Um, I was an English major, as you may have guessed if you've started reading the book. Um, and so I, I said it was would be a good idea. He thought it would be a good idea. Um, and and I, I thought he would enjoy it for two reasons. First of all, my father was very active in his local Anglican church. His faith was very strong. He wasn't very vocal about it, but but it was a part of who he was. And Canterbury, the end point of the pilgrimage, is the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury. So that's the head of the Anglican church worldwide. So it's kind of like the Rome for Anglicans. So I thought that would appeal to him. I also knew that he would like the idea of a walking holiday because my father and I, the one thing we really connected on uh, was being outdoors. He was the person who took me camping and taught me how to paddle a canoe and taught me how to fish, um, took me hunting. So all, all those kinds of things um, we did together. So it was a place we connected. So I knew he would really enjoy a walking holiday. Unfortunately, before we could go, um, he died. He had a heart attack and passed away. And so the idea was just sort of put on a shelf for about nine years. Um, and then about, about that time, I guess I was hitting a point in my life where I was really starting to question, like, what was I doing with my life? Like, what, how did I end up where I am? And um, it was probably depression, but it sort of disguised itself as this ma massive midlife crisis. And my wife, God bless her, said, Ken, go on the pilgrimage, the one you were going to do with your, with your dad. Um, I think you need to go take some time and just think about things. Um, and I, I, first I was reluctant. I said, well, that's going to be so expensive. My dad is dead. What's the point? And she said, no, go, we'll be fine. You go, you, you, um, you do what you need to do. So um, I did. So I took, I took the trip. I went on my own and did the trip that my father and I had meant to do together. So the pilgrimage starts here at Winchester Cathedral, which is beautiful Gothic cathedral. It's also the longest one in Europe. So it's one of the largest cathedrals. Um, and right away, I noticed there was something about this pilgrimage that I was going to enjoy. There were lots and lots of literary associations. So buried in uh, Winchester Cathedral in the floor of the nave, you can see on the right there is Jane Austen. So she spent her last months in Winchester when she was not feeling well to be close to the hospital. When she died, they, they buried her here in, in the cathedral. And there's a small chapel in Winchester that's dedicated to the man in the center who's Isaac Walton. So um, I know people don't read it too much anymore, but he wrote a very famous book called The Complete Angler, um, which is one of my favorite books. So, so I, I really, really wanted to see this. And I took the picture there of the, of the stained glass window above the altar, which sort of commemorates him. So the, the Itchen, the river that runs through Winchester, is a famous trout river, and, and Walton fished there as well. Um, so there's the, here's the interior of Winchester. You can see it's quite, quite, quite beautiful. And Winchester had, had its own saint. Um, the pilgrims going to Canterbury were going to the shrine of St. Thomas Becket in, in Canterbury. But before Becket, um, St. Swithin was found in Winchester. And he was one of the early bishops of Winchester, a very saintly man. And there's a great story, there's a great story about, um, about St. Swithin that, that everybody sort of should know because it's very similar to um, our Groundhog Day. They have St. Swithin Day, which is July 15th. So, the, the story is that when St. Swithin died, he asked to be buried outside of the church, in the, in the churchyard where the rain could fall on his grave. Um, but when the church started to be expanded, 
um, the church authorities decided to dig up his bones and move them inside and create a shrine to St. Swithin. Well, the story is that he was so upset about this that he caused it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, so on July 15th in England, if it's raining on July 15th, you're going to have a very wet summer. If it's dry on July 15th, it's going to be a very dry, dry summer. They have a, they have a, a short little um, poem that goes like this. St. Swithin's day, if thou dost rain, for 40 days it will remain. St. Swithin's day, if thou be fair, for 40 days twill rain, nay mare. So I thought that was kind of interesting for those of us who check out Groundhog Day to see if winter is going to get longer. I happened to be in England in May and it was wildflower season. It was beautiful. So walking through the woods, um, bluebells like this were everywhere. So it was really quite gorgeous. I'm just going to flip through a couple of slides to show you what the walking path looked like. So it follows mostly public rights of way today. So, so there'll be cart tracks, tracks through farmers fields, uh, bridal paths, hiking paths, um, and they're all sort of linked together to, to create this road. So it looks a bit like this is fairly typical. And every night I stayed in a small town. So this is New Ellisford. It was the town I stayed in my first night of walking. And it was a lovely Georgian town, as you can see. Um, and every night I would stay in a, a bed and breakfast or a pub or an inn. So it was, it was really quite nice. And every town had, a, had an interesting church. Uh, most were Norman, but some went back to the Anglo-Saxon period. This is, a, this is a Norman church in Bishop Sutton. And I took this picture because I loved the doorway. Um, some Norman stonemason had a really good imagination. So you can see above the doorway, there's that arched lintel. And chewing on the lintel, you can see the, the close up there are these weird beak shaped figures. I'm not sure what was going through his mind when he, when he carved this, but it's, it's quite entertaining. And, and fortunately they've, they've preserved it. And this house, some of you may recognize, is in Chawton. It was, I think, on my third day of walking, I, I arrived here. And the path goes right, right past this house. This was Jane Austen's house. So this, this is where she lived towards the end of her life. It's where she revised Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. And it's where she wrote all of her other books. So she was quite productive here. I think she was quite, quite happy here, actually. And there's an interesting story about this. So Jane had a sister and three brothers. But one brother's name was Edward. And they had... Um, the Austins had cousins named the Knights who were actually quite wealthy, but they had no children. So the Knights approached Mr. and Mrs. Austin and they said, we'd like to adopt Edward as our son so that all of our property stays in the family. The only condition is that he changed his last name to Knight. So the Austins thought, well, this is a good opportunity for Edward. They agreed. Um, and Edward then became Edward Knight and inherited the estates. And when he inherited the estates in Ch Chawton, this house was part of the estate and it was sitting empty. So Edward brought his widowed mother and his two sisters and they lived here free of, free of rent. So I think up until then they'd been pretty, they'd been living pretty close to the edge. But once Edward inherited and they could stay here, they suddenly no longer had to worry about money and, and things got a little bit better. So it's now a museum, you can walk through it. It's quite interesting. Um, another, another village I stopped in was Farnham. Um, and, and one of my heroes is, is a writer named William Cobbett. He was a radical journalist in the early part of the 19th century. Um, he, he published his own newspaper called the Political Register. And one of the interesting things Cobbett did was he would get on his horse and he would ride over all over Southern England and he would write about what he would see. And then he published these in his nurse newspaper as rural rides. Um, and those, those, those columns were later collected and published in a book called Rural Rides in 1830. Um, it's still in print. You can get the Penguin Classics edition if you're interested. And I carried this around with me when I was walking because I found it really interesting to read Cobbett's account of what, I, of what he was seeing compared with what I was actually seeing. And surprisingly, some of it hasn't changed all that much. So it was quite interesting. But he's buried in the church in Farnham and, and he was born in this pub. So it was renamed later uh, the William Cobbett. I think it was called the Jolly Farmer when he was a boy. But just some more scenes of the, of the, of the trail. You can see uh, walking through a water meadow here just outside of Farnham. So it's quite pretty in spots. Um, there was also some interesting artwork along the way. The, the trail passed quite close to the village of Compton. Um, and this is just outside of Compton. Um, in Compton, the graveyard was getting really, really crowded. So the town decided to buy some land, more land outside of town to expand the graveyard. And just up the hill from the new graveyard, uh, there was a house of a, a very prominent Victorian painter named George Frederick Watts, and he lived there with his wife, Mary. Watts, we don't really know much about Watts today, but in his, in his age, he was probably the most commercially successful artist um, in, in, in Victorian times. And they offered uh, 
the, the Watts offered to build um, a chapel for the, for the graveyard that they would pay for and that they would design. And it was really Mary who did all the work. Um, and the interesting thing is Mary was part of the Victorian arts and crafts movement. And she really believed that, that it was good for people to be taught how to do art and how to create their own art. And so what she did was she offered to train the local villagers um, in art so that they could create this chapel themselves. So all of these terracotta tiles you see and all of the painting that was on the interior walls, which is on the left, was all done by local amateurs. So it's really a beautiful building and it's really worth stopping and seeing. Um, the, the style is kind of hard to define. Some people have called it Art Nouveau. Some people have called it sort of Celtic inspired, but it really is a unique building. Nothing else like it anywhere I've seen. Some more pictures of the trail. This is St. Catherine's Chapel, the ruins of St. Catherine's Chapel um, near Guildford. And it's just above the River Way, which is down the bottom of the hill below here that you have to cross. And then it's St. Martha's Hill on the far side. So it gives you an idea of what, of what sort of terrain I was walking through. It was a high ridge. It's all chalk underneath the, the soil. And um, you're kind of walking along, along the top of the hill. This was all obviously the place where all the teenagers in Guildford came to party as well, because there were lots of campfire rings and lots of empty bottles I noticed. So good spot for them. Um, just some more of the some more of the trail, uh, some old farm tracks that once were part of the Pilgrim's Way. Um, there was lots of chances along the way too to think about religion. So um, part of the reason I was doing the, the trip was I was trying to think of like, is there a place for pilgrimage in the modern world for people like myself who may have fallen away from the church? My father was, was very devout. I wasn't so devout anymore. Um, I, haven't, I, I don't go to church as often maybe as I should. And I have some doubts about things that are in the profession of the Apostles' Creed, for example. Um, so I wondered, well, is there validity then still doing a pilgrimage for, for people like myself? And I, I concluded that there was. I mean, there's, there's always a good it's always a good thing to take some time out and sort of think about your life and think about what it is you believe and think about what your priorities should be. Um, but walking past this particular place made me think a bit about, about the place of religion in our lives. This is called the Apostles' Chapel. It's just outside a village of Albury. And it was built in the 1840s to be the center for a new Protestant sect called the Catholic Apostolic Church. Um, they were sometimes called the Irvingites because the, the leader was a Reverend Irvin who had been part of the Presbyterian church, but had broken away. Um, and this group were very evangelical. They believed that the second coming of Christ was going to happen any day now. So, so that's how they organized their church. Um, what happened, though, of course, is that in, in 1840, Christ didn't come and he didn't come in 1850 or 1860. And so slowly the, the congregation, which had numbered in the hundreds of thousands, slowly dwindles. And, and there are still some members, but it's, it's become quite a small sect. So it made me think a lot about, um, you know, the history of religion and how, and how religions rise and how they fall and, 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 and just what I thought about that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And just a little further along the, the path, you come to the village of Shear, and there's the, the Church of St. James in Shear had an, also an interesting story. Um, so in 1329, I think there was, a, there was a young girl named Christine Carpenter who petitioned the Bishop of Winchester to become an anchorite. So what she asked for was that they build a small stone cell that she could then live in and for in constant prayer for the rest of her life and that it would be built against the side of the village church. So you can see the outline on the left of where the, the stone cell had once been. And I can tell you because I stood right there that it's not very tall. It sort of came up to my shoulder and the length of it was shorter than, if I was to lie down flat, I would have to bend my knees to get inside. So if you can imagine there was a stone hut built against the outside wall of the church and this girl lived there from her teen years right to the end of her life, basically, as far as we know, um, in constant prayer. And on the inside of the church, you can see where they cut through the wall to give her a, a view of the inside of the church. So the, the, the funny shaped window that looks like a four leaf clover was where she could receive communion. Um, and the, the slanted opening is called a squint and it was designed so that she could see the altar so she could watch the service in progress. So you see things like that and you think, um, you know, that's, that's fairly extreme, but what, you know, what motivated her to do that? What kind of faith motivated her to do that? So, you know, things like that you see along the train make you, make you 
it was good. It was good to think about those kinds of things. And then you also saw more, more recent history. So all along the North Downs, because it, it runs just south of London, in the Second World War, they decided to build pillboxes to defend London just in case the Germans crossed the channel. So they built 38,000 of these things. Um, there's still about a thousand or so of them left, and, and many of them are there along the side of the trail. This one was open, so I kind of poked my head in and had a look around, but it makes you think that history isn't just ancient history. It's sort of still happening all along the North Downs. Um, another picture just to give you an idea of what this the, the landscape looks like. So this is this is the North Downs. If we're looking directly across the valley, that hill there, that wooded hill is called Box Hill, and it's it's a it's a National Trust property. It's a picnic site. Lots of people go there for, for hikes. Um, it's, it was famous in Jane Austen's day too. If you're familiar with Emma, one of her novels, there's a significant scene in the, in the novel set right here on Box Hill as well. And at the bottom of the hill is the River Mole. And I had to cross the mole. And that's how I crossed the mole. So there were stepping stones across the River Mole. So that I thought that was kind of cool. And then this is the view from the top of Box Hill looking into Dorking, which is where I, where I slept that night. So so um, this is kind of the pattern that I would follow. You'd walk along the top of the ridge and then at night when you needed a place to stay, you go down the hill to whatever town is closest and find a place to stay there. Um, and the reason for that was that I guess on, a to on top of a chalk hill, there's not very much water. So it wouldn't have supported a large settlement. So um, it was mostly just pasture. So if you wanted to build a town, you had to build it down below the, the hill where the, the soil was more clay and it was better for agriculture and there was more water for, for a settlement. Um, I threw this in just kind of out of interest as well. So when, I, when, you, when you go past Dorking and Rygate um, and you, you sort of head back up the hill, uh, you come to a big estate called Gatton Park. Gatton Park, incidentally, was built by Jeremiah Coleman. Anybody remember Coleman's mustard? That's how he made his fortune in mustard, and he built this big estate. But um, Gatton Park was also, in, in the early part of the 19th century, considered a rotten borough. And it was called a rotten borough because um, it returned two members to parliament at each election, but there were only seven voters. So, so it was very, very unfair. And, and William Cobbett, in particular, was scathing about this in, in when he was writing in the political register and he demanded that it be reformed. And in 1832, the, the Reform Act was passed and all these rotten boroughs were, aban were abolished. And Gatton Park was the most notorious because it just seemed very unfair that seven people could return two members of parliament to, you can imagine that wouldn't go down too well today. But this they called their town hall. So, the, and I think that's a little cynical actually, this is the Gatton town hall, so. This is where the seven voters met to, to vote. Um, a little further along um, and a little off the path, there was a, there's a small village called Chalden. And in the church, um, when they were doing some restorations in the 19th century, they discovered this mural. It had all been whitewashed over. And so they slowly removed the whitewash and this was revealed. And I apologize for the quality of this picture. Um, the other pictures I took with a camera, this one I snapped with a borrowed cell phone. So it's not, it's not the best the best shot, but but you can kind of get the picture. It's quite large. It's one of the earliest and best preserved examples of what's called a doom mural. So it was painted in the 13th century, I believe. Let me just double check that. But it was it was painted about the time that Thomas Beckett was martyred. So it's it's very um, contemporary with the time the pilgrims were coming through. Um, and you can see that it's a picture of what happens to us after we die. So there's a ladder in the middle and on, on the top left hand corner, St. Peter is weighing the souls of the dead. And if you're found to be okay, you get to climb the ladder up to heaven. If you're found wanting, you go down to hell, which is the lower level. And you can see there's all kinds of devils and imps um, enjoying themselves, torturing the souls of the damned. Um, and uh, down also in the bottom right is the tree, which is the, the tree of knowledge. And, and if you look carefully, you can see the serpent wrapped around the top of the tree. And the, above that, in the, in the upper thing, there's a very strange picture of um, Christ spearing the devil through the mouth with what looks like a long crucifix. Um, and the way this has been interpreted by historians is this is a depiction of the harrowing of hell. So one of the, one of the problems medieval hath, theologians had was if Christ came to redeem our sins and, and then we could all go to heaven, what happened to all the people who lived before Christ came? Did they all go to hell? So, so what they came up with was this theory that when Christ rose again from the dead, 
all of the good souls that, that were in hell from classical times were then sent up to heaven. So this is a depiction of the harrowing of hell when all of the good, the good Romans and Greeks and everything could then ascend to heaven. Um, this is a village of Godston. I just threw this in because it gives you an idea of the sort of places I was staying. So I stayed in the little inn you can see there, um, which was built, I believe, in the reign of Richard II. So that's how long they've been hosting guests. Um, some of the trail looked like this. It was so old that it had actually sunk into the ground. The picture on the left is called a Holloway. So on either side of the trail, there's a very dense hedge, which is grown together overhead to make kind of a green tunnel. But because people have been walking here for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's been raining a lot, the trails actually started to sink down into the earth. So the level of the fields on either side of this trail is probably at the height of my shoulders, but you're walking sort of below the, the level of the fields because just horses and people's feet have just worn it away over the centuries. So these, these are called Holloways in, in southern, southern England. And I threw the picture of the tombstone in on the right because in Godstone in, in the graveyard, there's the grave of a very famous pirate named Edward Trenchman. And um, I thought it was interesting that on his grave, they put the skull and crossbones. So um, that just kind of struck me as curious. Uh, this is the village of Rotham, another one of the little villages I walked through. What makes the church in Rotham interesting is that they decided to put the walkway right through the tower. You can see there's sort of a tunnel right through the tower. Rather than making people go down and walk on the road, they could walk right, right through the tower on passing from one side of the village to the other. And if you go into the tunnel, you'll notice that some of the stones inside the tunnel are really deeply scarred like this one on the left. Local historians believe that uh, archers stopped here to sharpen their arrows on the way to the village green to practice archery. And, and it makes you think that um, in the Middle Ages, it was the English longbow that gave the English um, armies the edge over the French. So if, if you remember your Henry V and you know the, the battle there and, and the French cavalry charging down the hill towards Henry, it was the archers on either side that stopped them. So it was these guys, these village um, yeomen who, who made the English army so, so um, difficult to defeat. And so everybody learned how to use a longbow. And you can imagine guys walking here, scraping their arrows on the side of the wall just to get them sharp. I've reached the Medway Valley, which is a little, little past the halfway point. It's the biggest river that I would have to cross. So the Medway River is down in the middle of this valley. Um, and the stones in, in the foreground are a, an ancient burial mound. It's called the Coldrum Stones. And originally they were arranged in a circle and they had stone capstones over top and then it was all covered with earth and the bodies were in the center part of the chamber. But over the years, the, the soil has worn away, the stones have been removed, probably farmers used them in walls and stuff like that or building barns and this is what's left. So it's one of the better, better preserved ones. Um, but in the Medway Valley, there's a, there's a whole bunch of these. There's, there's, these, there's this stone circle, there's Kitts Cody House across, there's the countless stones, there's a couple um, just down to my right. So there was quite a large concentration of these Neolithic ruins. So um, that was another reason that people thought that maybe this Pilgrim's Way was actually a very old road because people have been passing this way since, since uh, Neolithic times. And that the ridge on the far side there is where I'll be walking in two days. So from here, I go up left a little bit to Rochester, and then we come back down on the other side of the river. And I just threw this in because it was really pretty. Looks like a postcard. And this is how I cross the Medway River. So this is the Medway Viaduct, obviously very modern. Um, it's actually three bridges side by side. Two are for, for road traffic. And the third one, the one that's closest to you, is... Um, the one that carries the high-speed train from London to the Channel Tunnel. So, and it's, it's, um, it's the, the train crossing this bridge has been clocked at the highest speed of any train in England. So it really zips by here, but it was actually very intimidating watch it, walking across this bridge. Um, pilgrims in the Middle Ages would have taken a ferry here. There wasn't a bridge like this. And this is Rochester. So that's Rochester Castle on the left and Rochester Cathedral on the right. Rochester turned out to be a really pretty town. I, I expected because it's a sort of seaport, um, the Medway drains into the English Channel and Rochester ships can come up as far as the Medway to Rochester, many of them dock there. Um, I thought it'd be kind of a grubby seaport, but actually it was quite an attractive town. And it's interesting if you look at um, 
Rochester Castle, it probably looks kind of familiar. And the reason for that is the person who designed Rochester Castle and the extension on the cathedral was the same architect who designed the Tower of London. So if you've seen pictures of the Tower of London where the Queen's jewels are, it looks very similar to Rochester Castle, same, same sort of design, same sort of Norman design. Uh, I threw this in because this is a this is a mural that was preserved inside Rochester Cathedral. They found it, um, I think, in the late 19th century when they were doing some renovations and they moved a big a big uh, pulpit. And behind the pulpit, they found this half of a mural. They figured the rest of it was probably damaged during the Reformation when it would have been painted over. But it's a depiction of the Wheel of Fortune, and it's it's um, painted about the same time that Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. And if, you, if you've read the Canterbury Tales, and I've had a few people groan when I say that, um, the Monk's Tale is, is a whole series of short stories depicting the fortunes of famous people. So he talks about the Wheel of Fortune and Dame Fortune, who's standing in the middle of this wheel, turning the spokes. So the idea is that the person on the bottom is a poor man, and the person going up on the left-hand side is a, is a slightly wealthier, maybe landowner, a yeoman. And the person on the top is quite a wealthy man because he's dressed quite well. And if the rest of the painting hadn't been scraped away, you would have seen the wealthy man falling back down again. So the idea that fortunes are, are circular was something that was part of the, the medieval frame of mind, um, which is comforting to poor people, but it was also sort of a warning to rich people, don't, uh, don't uh, you know, get too cocky, don't, don't take things for granted. Um, because your fortunes can fall again. Rochester is also the center of a Dickens festival every year. And you'll notice the year I was walking through, which is 2014, um, they were celebrating David Copperfield, which is great because David Copperfield walked right down this street that, that we're standing in. He passed from London through Rochester. And part of the book, if you've read it, takes place in Canterbury. And another big part of the book takes place on in the coast in Kent. And I don't know if anybody saw it, but there was a recent... Um, there was a recent um, sort of television movie of David Copperfield starring, um, oh, the guy who was in, oh, it's, it's, it's lost me, but it was, it was really good. So watch it if you, if you see it. I think it was on, I think it was on Crave if you get a chance. So, but it's quite, as you can see, quite, quite pretty. And this is, this is Rochester taken from the top of the castle. And I took this picture because the bridge that's there is obviously a modern bridge. But the first bridge that bridged the Medway here was actually built by the Romans. And the road that's running through the center of Rochester that crosses the river here is the, is the early Roman road that went from London to Dover and passing through Canterbury on its way. So this is where Roman legions, legionaries would have marched. This is where Chaucer's pilgrims would have walked on their way, on their way to Canterbury. Um, it's where David Copperfield fled when he left London to go um, escape from his, his terrible life there as well. And um, I threw this in because, uh, again, it was like this really strange thing. So um, once I get past Rochester and I'm getting towards Canterbury, I, there's this one sheep pasture I'm walking through. And I notice as I'm walking and I look down at my feet that the path is all daisies. And on either side of the path, it's all grass. And it just struck me as the strangest thing I'd ever seen. And I couldn't quite figure out why that would be because it was a sheep pasture. Why would the daisies only grow where people were walking? And the only thing I could think of is that maybe our boots were, were carrying the seeds along or something like that. Um, so it, this path went from one style to another style where it crossed the, the things. And, and, and I just thought it was quite miraculous that you know there's a path of daisies on the way to Canterbury. The picture on the right is all that's left of Boxley Abbey. Um, in the Middle Ages, Boxley Abbey is quite a large monastic establishment, and it was a place where pilgrims on their way to Canterbury would stop to sleep for the night. So this is the old um, Great Hall for the, for the Abbey. It's where people would come in and be fed, and then they would sleep on the floor at night to spread out some straw and sleep on the floor and then carry on the next day. Uh, today, it's part of somebody's farm, and it's been turned into a barn, but that's, that's all that remains of of the abbey. All of these abbeys, all of the shrines that were associated with pilgrimage were all destroyed um, during the reign of Henry VIII. He was breaking away with Rome, and so he was trying to wrest control of the church, and he also needed money. So he, he confiscated a lot of this stuff and redistributed it. Um, this, this particular abbey, he took the lands and he gave them to a family that was supporting him called the Wyatts, and uh, Francis Wyatt would become the first governor of Virginia. So that there's, there's a bit of history there too. Just another picture of the way you can see the path. This is a kissing gate land going across. 
and it's the Medway Valley down below, and the Met, the river's kind of in the top of the picture there. And just beyond the river, it's really hard to see. Right up in here, kind of in the top center there, that's Leeds Castle. So if anybody's familiar with that, I didn't get to see it because I was on the wrong side of the river, but it's a fairly famous spot to visit. This is Hollingburn, one of the one of the little villages I passed through on the way to Canterbury. I, I stuck this picture in because people of Hollingburn had beautiful gardens. They really cared for their gardens. It was really quite a picturesque place. And in the summer, all these little villages are full of wedding parties. So if you're going to do this walk, make sure you book your rooms well in advance because if you leave it too late, you'll find in the villages you go to, there won't be any place to sleep because they're all been booked up solid by people getting married in these little churches. This seems to be a very popular thing to do for Londoners. And that's me. The only picture I have of me on the Canterbury, uh, another hiker took this picture for me. Um, and this is a bench by the side of the trail that some kind person has put there for people to rest. And he's carved this figure on the end, which is called Brother Percival, so an, another pilgrim. I threw this picture in, not because it's a good picture, but because I mentioned earlier that Jane Austen's brother Edward had inherited large estates from the Knight family. So this was another one of the estates that he inherited, and it's just outside of Canterbury. Um, it's called Godmersham Park, and it's um, today it's a college for opticians, so it's not a it's not a big country home anymore. But but Jane Austen spent a lot of time here. Um, she was very fond of her nephews and nieces. She would come and stay here. And the great attraction of Godmersham Park was that she got her own room. So if she wanted to sit and write, she could close the door and actually get some writing done in privacy, which she didn't have in her house in Chawton, apparently. Um, but you can also imagine if you're a fan of Jane Austen and, and, and there's many big country houses in many of her books, this is where she got the experience to write, to write those scenes because she was living the life, so to speak. She would come and visit her brother and sort of vicariously live what it was like to be the the owner of a large country estate. We're almost at Canterbury now. This is just outside of Canterbury. It's called Bigbury Hill. Um, it's a bit of a mess because they were doing archaeology digs here. So they were cutting down the trees so they could, they could see the hill. Bigbury Hill was an old Iron Age hill fort. So at the top of this hill, there's a big deep trench. And then inside the trench at one time, there would have been a wooden palisade, um, which was the fort. What makes Bigbury Hill sort of famous in English history is it's the place where the Britons and Julius Caesar's Romans first met in a large battle and Caesar trounced them. So that was the beginning of Roman Britain. The legionaries charged up this hill, the Britons were inside the palisade and the legionaries under the cover of their shields filled the ditch with baskets of earth. They kept carrying up baskets of earth until they'd, filled, they'd created a ramp and then they charged across the ditch and took the fort and the Britons all fled. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for, for, for the Britons and, and the beginning of Caesar's conquest of, of the British Isles. And this is your first view of Canterbury. So you, you get a little past Bigbury Hill. You, there's a little village called Harple Down. And when you look to the east, there you can see the, the rooftops of Canterbury. And this would have been the, the view that early pilgrims would have seen too. This is what they were waiting for. So it's quite satisfying to see the, the big tower of the cathedral there. Canterbury was badly bombed in the Second World War. So about a quarter of the town was just flattened. So it's all modern, but fortunately the area around the cathedral was spared. So it's still quite medieval in flavor. So you enter through the West Gate, which is still there. And about half of the old medieval wall around Canterbury still exists. And you can get up and walk around most of it if you want to take, take, see, this, see the, the town from up above. Um, but also just you can see that some of the some of the buildings are, are really quite lovely, but also quite old. So the, the buildings on the left are, are buildings that were built by French Huguenot weavers who fled to England to escape religious persecution. So they, they built this, this row of houses. And the building on the right is the old Pilgrim's Hospital. So in Chaucer's time, poor pilgrims could have stayed here for free. It was a charitable institution. It was just a big hall. They could go and there would be food there and they could sleep. Um, wherever they wanted. I think today they use it mostly for music concerts, but it's interesting to see that it's still, it's still here after all that time. And then this is your first view sort of of the cathedral as you're walking through the old streets. You see that you see the tower sticking up, you go through a big gate into the cathedral grounds and there it is, there's Canterbury Cathedral, which would have been the end point of, of anyone's pilgrimage who was coming to see St. Thomas Becket. Unfortunately, that shrine is gone. So Henry VIII took it away. 
Um, what they have instead is they've created this modern altar at the place where, where Beckett was murdered. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail. You'll have to read the book. But um, Beckett stood up against the king, who at the time was Henry II, um, defending the rights of the church against the rights of the monarchy, which surprised everybody because they'd been friends. And Henry was the one who sort of um, engineered Beckett's appointment as the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he expected Beckett's support when he wanted to introduce some reforms. And then to his surprise, Beckett said, no, we answer to the Pope, not to the King of England. And so there was this knocking of heads, which ended in some of uh, Henry's knights actually murdering uh, Beckett right here um, in December, a very cold, dark night. Um, they, they basically chopped his head open and he died right here. And that was the beginning of sort of the legend of Thomas Beckett and and the beginning of his sainthood so and then many people were coming to the the shrine that was built over his grave and lots of miracles happened and so it became in its day the third most popular pilgrimage site in england or in england not in europe um the most the place people wanted to go of course was jerusalem but that wasn't always possible so there was rome and then santiago and then canterbury and sort of order of popularity so lots of people came here And I'm gonna end my slideshow with this slide. So at the very end of my pilgrimage, after I'd sort of had a tour of the cathedral, I went down into the undercroft, which is sort of the basement of the cathedral, which is older than the, 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 the cathedral up above. And, and down in the undercroft, there's this picture still survives. And it's one of the oldest wall paintings um, in England. It's from the 12th century. And, and there's a little place there where you can sit and pray if you want. And I was sitting on the bench and I was looking up at it and I realized, oh, I know what this story is. If you're familiar with your, your New Testament, it's the story of the naming of John the Baptist. And you can see, I didn't take these pictures because you're not supposed to take pictures down there. I borrowed them from the Canterbury website. And, and some an artist has sort of redrawn the picture so it's easier to see. And that's what's down the right-hand corner. So if you're familiar with the story, um, uh, Elizabeth, who's John the Baptist's mother, who's on the left, and Zachariah, his father, who's sitting in the chair on the right, were actually quite elderly when John the Baptist was born. Um, they never expected to have children. So they, they viewed his, his birth as, as a miracle. And, and Zachariah was so awestruck, he, he actually stopped talking. So when people said, well, what are you going to call your son? He actually had to write it down on a piece of paper so that they would know what his son's name was. So you can see that Zachariah is writing there in Latin. Uh, his name is John, basically, um, and handing that over. So I thought that was a really appropriate place to stop the pilgrimage. It was complete serendipity. I didn't know that picture was there, but I'd done the picture, I'd done the pilgrimage as a way of kind of uh, celebrating my father's life and saying goodbye to my father. And here was a depiction of fatherhood in a sense. So it got me thinking about my dad and about my own children and the relationship I have with them and and how realizing that was that's really the greatest um, blessing in my life is, is, is being a father and, and all that, that, all that that means. So that was one of the takeaways I had from, from my pilgrimage. And I guess I'll leave it there. So if, if there's questions, we can, we can take some of those maybe now I'll stop sharing. That was great, Ken. I really enjoyed, um, the photography, the history, and it's um, very enticing to read your book. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we'll look over to the questions here. I see that Leanne has put links. If anybody would like to copy um, those links, that's how to um, to get a copy of Ken's book. And Grant asks, um, did you meet any other pilgrims on your journey? Um, no. Um... I don't think it's a really popular pilgrimage route. And to be honest, that was one of the appeals. Um, I thought about doing the, the uh, Compostela, the Santiago road in Spain. It, it always appealed to me, but I also know that like hundreds of thousands of people do that every year. The, the pilgrimage to Canterbury is, is much um, less well-traveled. Um, for one thing, there's not as many beds along the way for people to stay in. I think it's just also less well-publicized. Um, and I did meet pilgrims when I reached Canterbury. There were other people who went to the church the night I arrived, and we all sort of arrived together, and we went to the Evensong service. So they had also done the walk, but I didn't really bump into anybody else as I was walking. Okay. Um, Elaine has put yes, out... Yes, it's Dev Patel. Thank you, Elaine. It's <laughs> great. Personal History of David Coffrey. Watch it. It's really well done. Um, so there you go. If you haven't read the book, watch that. 
Okay. Um, and Tracy says, from one English major to another, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, your daughters are very fortunate to have you in, as a father. And actually, I think it's one daughter and two sons. If I one remember. daughter, two sons. Yes, but thank you, Tracy. Yep, thank you, Tracy. Okay. And what else have we got here? Um, this is from Collingwood Public Library. Uh, what happened along your journey that was totally unexpected or surprising to you? Good question. Mm, that's a great question. Um, I guess part of it was I was I was going not really knowing what to expect would happen, and and what I discovered was that uh, getting to Canterbury wasn't really the important thing. That once I got started walking, I really just started enjoying the journey. Um, there's something wonderful about a walking holiday. You, you go very slow. You've got lots of time to think. Um, lots of people, lots of writers and philosophers have said there's a, there's a connection between walking and thinking. Um, and and uh, so I, I felt like the, the important thing about the pilgrimage that I learned really is it's not so much the destination as the intention. Um, a pilgrimage is kind of like a holiday with a purpose. And the purpose really is to... to do something for the good of your soul or reset your priorities. And I think that's, that's mostly what I, what I learned on, on the pilgrimage, that I was just really enjoying the journey. And yes, someone else asked, would you go on another long distance walk? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I did a couple of years ago, I did the coast to coast walk across Northern England. So I was inspired to try something else. Okay, so Marianne says, hi, Ken. Um, hi, Marianne. <laughs> um, this is the trail we uh, marked to do. Sorry, the font is so small. Um, this is the trail we marked to do, or have you, um, you have to know. Oh, where to go. okay. Oh, I think I know what she's asking. Yes, how easy was it to find my way? Yeah. Um, I was fortunate in that <clears throat> I had someone helping me and he gave me a whole series of maps and he highlighted the trail with a, with a highlighter and they were really detailed maps. So I, I didn't really get lost. Well, I did get lost at one point, which I mentioned in my book, but it, not for very long. Um, so I was lucky. The first part of the trail from Winchester to about um, Guildford is, is not as well marked as the rest of the trail. One, and particularly when you get from Rochester down to Canterbury, it's very easy to find the trail because lots of people do that section. A lot of people coming from London start in Rochester and then walk to Canterbury. They don't do the section between Winchester and Rochester. That's not quite as well marked. Um, but there are good guidebooks now that there weren't when I, when I took the walk. There was one published just a couple of years ago that's got good maps in it and good descriptions of the walk. So I don't think you would get lost. I don't think that would be a concern. The other thing is you're in England, right? And you're, you're, you're within a hundred yards of somebody. You can just go off the trail into a farm and ask, where am I? Can somebody point oh. me on, on the right road, right? So, <laughs> so you don't have to worry. About, and they speak English, which is even better. So you don't have to worry about getting lost, I don't think. Yeah, no, I, I bet you many in the group are thinking, hmm, I might like to do this. Yeah. Okay, so Grant asks, uh, or Grant says, a fabulous talk. I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to read the book, like all of us, I'm sure. Can you perhaps tell us a little bit about how the book developed? Okay, um, good question. So when I came back from the walk, I wasn't necessarily intending to write a book, but I did have this idea that it might make a really good magazine article. So I started writing it out as a magazine article, but it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And, and I realized this is too long to go into a magazine. So I thought, well, maybe it would be a book. Um, but then um, I was actually very fortunate. Um, I don't know if Lori mentioned this at the beginning, but I used to work at the Collingwood Public Library up until a few months ago when I retired. So when I was at when I was at the Collingwood Library, we started a writing group that met um, two nights a month. And so um, I was kind of in charge of facilitating that. So I always felt obligated to bring something to the to the group that I'd been writing. So I thought, oh, well, this book would be a really good project for me. So. So the, the poor long suffering souls in the Collingwood writing groups saw this book from its beginning, they saw it chapter by chapter by chapter as I, as I wrote it. And it was actually really good because it's nice to have a live audience to read something too, because you can tell right away if it's working or if it's not. And they were quite honest with me, very nice, but honest. They would say, uh, Ken, no, that, that didn't work. You can cut that out of the book. It was, it was a dud. And so, so in, in a way you had your first reader right there. So, so if, you're, if you're thinking about writing, you know, if, if you can join a writing group like that, it's probably really helpful. It was for me. It, it gave me a deadline because I had to have something ready every two weeks. And it gave me an, a very appreciative audience that were really um, helpful with their criticism. Great. 
Okay, maybe that's a question. Did you have to book your accommodation ahead? I cheated, Migs. I, I, um, I contacted a man named Derek Bright, and I mentioned him in my book. Uh, he lives just outside of Canterbury, and he runs a company called Walk a While Holidays. And um, I realized when I was trying to do it on my own over the internet, look, trying to figure out where I would stay each night, it was just really complicated. So I asked Derek to take care of that for me. So he booked all the accommodation um, so that I just had to walk. I, I knew there was a place for me every night to stay. Um, I also had a small suitcase, which he made sure made it to my next in or bed and breakfast so that it was waiting for me there when I got there. And that way I only had to carry on my back what I needed for the day, which was mostly my lunch and rain gear because it rained on and off all throughout the trip. So, and that's, that's England. So you got to go prepared for that. It is going to rain. Um, but the nice thing is you're sleeping under a roof at night so you can get everything dried out before you leave the next morning. Nice. Okay, Suzanne says, um, would you do this walking trip um, with your children someday? I would love to do a walking trip with my children someday. Um, I'm not sure when that day would be, though, because they've all got their own lives right now and trying to get them all organized to go on a walking trip. But yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I've gone canoeing um, with my kids and, and uh, my sons and I went on a, uh, a hike in the Bruce Peninsula not too long ago, which, which was a lot of fun. But it, it would just be a matter of finding the time. Yeah, I would like that very much if it's possible. Yeah, we have full circle. Yeah. Um, okay, Lori mentions, um, what would your father have shared about your journey with your children, his grandchildren? Um, what, what so would you think his favorite part of the pilgrimage would have been? Um, that, that's easy. You'd have to know my dad. My dad was a people person. Um, when I was growing up, he was, as I mentioned, he was very involved in the church, very much a community volunteer. And in, after we moved out of the house, um, his house kind of just became a place where people stayed. If people were in trouble and they needed a bed or something, they stayed with my dad. Every time I went to visit him, there was some somebody else staying at the house sort of that he was hosting. So um, for my father, the most interesting part of the trip would have been the people that we met on the walk. He loves talking to people. He loves listening to, he's a good listener. He loves, he loves listening to their stories. And, and I think that would have been the part of the, the pilgrimage. He, he wouldn't have cared about the churches or the artwork or the books that I keep quoting. He, he would have been most, he would have had most fun just talking to people along the way. He was really good. He was very good that way. He brought the best out in people. Um, the thing about my father, I realized when I was looking at photographs of him, I have lots of photographs of my dad. Every single photograph of my father, he's smiling. And it's not, he's not smiling for the camera the way I might. He's, he's just smiling. It's like a welcoming smile. That's just, that's just the way I remember my dad. So yeah, I think that's what he would have enjoyed, just talking to people. Well, that's a fond memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we're at the end. Is there any other questions out there before we're our timing is just about coming up to eight o'clock, which is, which is uh, probably the end of our, our time. So anybody else have any other questions before we end our session? Okay. Uh, oh, and we're just yes. posting the um, where you can get a copy of Ken's books. Jessica's book nook in Thornbury, and I think you've signed some copies there, didn't you, Ken? I, I did. Yeah. So. Um, and and I noticed that the my publisher has put their website on here too, because they you can order directly from their website as well. Yeah. So yes. Oh, yes. So I I I I should just mention maybe uh, just give them a plug before I leave that uh, the University of Alberta Press was was a great group to work with. It's a very small publishing house, but um, I got really good um, assistance writing with editing this book and putting it together. They did a wonderful job uh, with the design. I don't know if you've seen the, the cover is beautiful and and the, the inside of the book has been very well laid out and very well copy edited. They cut all kinds of mistakes that I'd made, um, which would have been very embarrassing if they'd made it to print. So, um, and Kathy, who sent that is, is the marketing agent there. She's done a great job trying to get the word out about the book. So um, I have nothing but great things to say about the University of Alberta Press. They're small, but mighty. They've done it. They've done a great job. They, they also published my first book, the one on Bhutan as well. Great. Um... And, oh, someone's asking about getting a copy of this presentation. We will be posting it, I believe, on Monday on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and then type in Collingwood Public Library, it's um, very easy to access there. If you have any problems, you can reach out to me um, by, via email, but it's, um, it's very easy to access and that will be posted soon. We'll probably put something on our social media saying that it's available 
to watch because I know there were some regrets tonight that didn't make it and and some people that didn't um, get a chance to book in so they'll be happy to know that they can still view this so that's great yeah have I missed anything or lots of compliments on the cover um that was my um questions is was that an artist that did that or yeah um yeah so there's oh I don't know if I can is it in cover yeah it's hard to see but that's the cover it's done by an English artist named Liz Somerville and it's it's a lino cut um and it she did a series of prints along the pilgrim's way and I guess our my publisher someone at the publisher probably the book designer um was looking for something for a cover image for my book and he came across this and he approached the artist and said could we use it for the for the cover of the book and she agreed and and it really is a, a lovely picture and the and the image on the cover is actually the water meadow just outside of Winchester so um if you're reading my book I, I talk about walking on Keats walk well this is that that's Keats walk so that's that's the the image in on the cover of the book so and that little tower in the back in the distance would be the top of Winchester Cathedral so so very appropriate and quite quite nice yes I keep getting compliments about it I wish I could say it was my design but it's not <laughs> um, Kathy your publisher has said chosen by Alan um, Alan Brownoff okay yeah, thanks yeah. Kathy I thought it was probably Alan's choice yes he's he did the design at, for the book and he did a wonderful design great okay well if there isn't any other questions we're right at um we we're aiming to wrap up at eight o'clock and here we are at 7 59 so thank you so much for joining us tonight ken um it was my pleasure yeah former pub um our used to be our ceo at the library and then we had um ashley to the land acknowledgement so that was a nice evening i really appreciate everybody attending tonight and if if you know someone that did want to see this just tell them to access our YouTube site and you can watch it again. So it was a um, really nice way of, of um, having a book talk with this slideshow of um, fabulous photography. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming everyone. And we'll, um, we'll end the session. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Bye everyone. Bye.